So guys, recently I took a look at this Acorn prototype as well as a couple other iPhones. If you watched the last video, link in the description, you would have seen this iPhone. Most noticeably, it lacks the iPhone text and only has its serial number and non-FCC authorization. If you look closely at the serial number, you can tell it was made in 2006. Most importantly, as a plastic screen likely being one of the few iPhones produced with a plastic screen, not the Acorn, as it's significantly earlier. Now, unfortunately, I can't show you a whole lot about it, is you can see this massive crack in the middle. Um, ironically, it's probably some of the reason why the plastic did not make it. You know, it, it's really not that durable. Steve himself complained about the phone scratching in his pocket, and I would beg to say, in general, it is a quite horrible design. The whole story of Corning, Gorilla Glass, and Apple's partnership with them is all quite interesting, but that is not what I am here to talk about today. What I am here to talk about is the software these would have run. Now, unfortunately, as I said, it's broken. The board on the inside is munched. It's cool on the outside, but on the inside, it does nothing. However, I did show off this phone as well. This is another Prototype 2G, also from 2006, but with a glass screen, lacking any of the coolness of the plastic, however, it is still early. This is possibly one of the earliest 2Gs out there that actually runs. So let's turn it on. Now, unfortunately, it's not quite that simple, as the batteries on these have kind of gone toast over the last couple years. So we gotta plug it in. So you might ask, what's this? This is a Gorilla or a debug cable for 30 pin devices. Apple has a whole host of different versions of these that change as the phones change. There's newer ones, there's older ones. This is at least the most relevant and easily accessible one. So if we plug it into the phone, it'll charge, but most importantly, it will also give us a lot of readouts from the system. So if we press the power button, we can see that the phone does try to power on, but it doesn't. Interestingly on this one, you do have to hold it down for quite a while to actually get the phone to turn on. Now, if we scroll up a little bit, we can see it's iBoot, it has a copyright of 2006, and it's actually version number 87. That's somewhat insane as the current iBoot we're on with iOS 16, I believe is somewhere around version 7400. This is absurdly early compared to that. Actually, I believe one of the earliest known iBoots to have publicly leaked was version 99. So this is perhaps the earliest version of iBoot and iOS as a whole that exists out there. Now, if we scroll back down, we'll see the battery is charging. As I said, these are kind of horrible. Amazingly, these prototype 2Gs do seem to turn on no matter what condition the battery is in. It's just a matter of how long it takes to turn on. So let's give it a bit. So now that the phone's finally charged, we're beginning to boot. Interestingly, it does have a normal Apple logo. This is somewhat unique to these devices, as I'll show later. So if we take a look at the phone and what it's running, we can see that it's really simple. This is actually a skank phone. However, this is all the phone really has. There is no other menu, there is nothing else. Later builds, as we'll get to shortly, are a lot more complex, but this is rather simple. There's an other tab, you can, interesting, select the startup disk, which implies it's possible to boot these from some kind of external media. I'm not entirely sure. If you know anything, leave something down in the comments. There's, you know, a phone app, it's, very terrible and blocky. There's a web browser that you could use. There's Playground, which has, you know, accelerometer readouts and whatnot. There's a whole slew of just really, really simple apps. You can even go into Other and go into Operator, interestingly enough, which this is similar to almost any version of Operator that works. Although, as expected with a device this early, it is quite buggy. As you can see, I am now hung. I could only but feel bad for the poor engineers that had to deal with this on likely a daily basis. So let's take a look at the internal software side while the phone figures its life out. If we run a simple command to list out the file system, we can see it is astoundingly simple. There really isn't a lot to be shown here. You have a simple Apple internal library, you have a system volume, user volume, and you have the various kernels. Interestingly enough, there is a kernel included for FPGAs. Otherwise, really simple bare bones file system is again, this is all that is on the device. There is no GUI, there is no switchboard. It's just skank phone. It just loads into this. It is very, very simple. 
If we list the kernel version, you can actually see that the compile date is February 21st of 2007, very early on, and again, lines up with around the keynote times, and this being a 2006 produced phone on perhaps one of the earliest versions of iOS. You might ask what a later prototype looks like. As I've been saying the whole time, this is not what they are. So let's take a look at that. So this is a blank back prototype. These are a lot closer to production. Some of them are PVT, some of them are earlier, varies a whole lot from unit to unit. If we plug it in, we'll see immediately there's a gear logo and it's big. This is very, very different from the Apple logo this had. This is definitively its own different thing. This is not iOS. This is switchboard. This is its own operating system meant exclusively for testing. As you can see, we have what looks more or less like a GUI and we're greeted with a selection of app icons. If we go into Skank Phone, you will see it is almost the exact same as this. However, it is arranged a bit differently. We have a quit here instead of an about this device here. The settings are roughly the same. The functions are all roughly the same. However, there's way more to it. If we go back to the main menu, we can see there's operator. This is the same as operator on the other device. However, it's housed as its own app. There's also rumble, AT command, sound wave. There's all these options. Again, these are still early, still somewhat janky and working through the process. We can see operator looks nearly the same as we, we can even quit out of it. It's far less janky than this one. They've begun to polish things off and make their own defined testing OS completely separate from iOS. If we scroll up away further, we can see this is running iBoot 204. This is a lot later, still 2007, still somewhat early. However, it is far later on down the chain of development. It's different, it's its own thing, and it's not as early as this. If we list out the file system contents, you can see it's still simple, however, it's condensed. There's no FPGA kernel, there's a release kernel, there's a development kernel. There has a lot more to it as there is a proper OS now, however, it's still very simple. It does not have everything iOS has. It does not need everything iOS needs. It's just for testing, but it is vastly improved from the previous version. If we list out the kernel, we can see the compile date is October 10th of 2007. Likely dating this is some kind of factory quality control device opposed to some kind of very early prototype. As you can see, a lot further down the line, they were able to polish things off and make a good separate dedicated testing OS that works simply. Steps like these are important to ensuring that testing of devices can be done consistently and reliably. Without this, we would not have the quality control that allows, I would beg to say, 99% of iPhones to come out of factories in a capacity where you're happy with them as an end user. This OS allows for comprehensive multi-stage device testing in a simple way anyone can do. Nowadays, it's a lot more of a complex automated process, but back then it was real people in the factories testing these phones. There were hundreds upon hundreds of people on the Foxconn lines testing these phones, and it needed to have a lightweight OS that could easily be used for testing that anyone can use. I hope this was an interesting dive into perhaps some of the earliest iPhones ever made, and is a really cool glimpse into the software side of it all. Please let me know what else you want to see down in the comments, and be sure to like and subscribe for more future videos.